So, yes, um, I have been writing about Anne Askew. And that is, this is the novel, Prize for the Fire. And um, so I'll just tell you a bit about her. On July 16th, 1546, a young Lincolnshire gentlewoman was taken out of Newgate Prison in London, tied to a chair, and carried to Smithfield, where, with, um, where she was chained to a stake and along with three others, burned alive for the crime of heresy. Her name was Anne Askew. She was 25 years old. She'd been arrested multiple times, put on trial before a citizen's council, the mayor, the Bishop of London, the King's Privy Council, for violating the Act of Six Articles, which was one of the many contradictory religious laws passed during the reign of Henry VIII. The Act made it a capital crime, punishable by burning, to deny the doctrine of transubstantiation. That is, to say that it was not the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament of the altar, but that it was but a symbol or a sign of the body and blood of Christ. We know Anne's story because she wrote about it. That book, The Examinations of Anne Askew, was published just months after her death. She wrote in, deta the in detail about her trials, how she stood a woman alone before the priests and prelates and men of the council and answered them back with the authority of the English Bible, which she took to be God's final authority over all principles and principalities. Sometimes, otherwise, she stood before them in silence and smiled. They did not like that. She was an extraordinary historical character. She's been portrayed as a religious fanatic, a woman of fantastic courage and faith, a froward, reckless woman who refused to conform to Christian principles. Her life has been used as a polemic to support any number of different views, which is why, actually, you'll still find errors about her, even including on her Wikipedia page. She was caught at the nexus of Tudor politics, religion, and patriarchy. This was her undoing. She came to her fate in the earliest days of the English Reformation, which were the last days of King Henry VIII. Henry VIII, yes, endlessly fascinating. He of the six wives, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Defender of the faith under the authority of Pope Leo X, supreme head of the church under the authority of himself overseer of the English Reformation, one of the prime examples in history of that condition now known as malignant narcissism. When Prize for the Fire opens, Henry's first two wives are already dead. Catherine of Aragon died a year previous, just four months before Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn, lost her head. In fact, here's a little historical tidbit. Anne Askew's father, Sir William Askew, served on the jury that condemned Anne Boleyn's accused lovers to death. It's an intriguing bit of history that I couldn't somehow make fit into the novel, but now you all know it. So at the book's opening, <clears throat> Henry is on his third wife, Jane Seymour, the one who died, giving birth to his son and heir. By the novel's end, he's on his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, the one who survived. Barely. It was Anne Askew's connection to the ladies of Catherine Parr's court, and very possibly to the queen herself, that brought Anne Askew to such trouble. We know from her own writings in the examinations that she had already been condemned to death by burning when she was taken to the Tower of London and tortured. We know, too, from her writings that it wasn't her theological heresies that her torturers asked her about. It was fellow travelers like-minded believers, members of her sect that they were after, especially the ladies of the court. Anne says in her writings, then they did put me on the rack because I confessed no ladies nor gentlewomen to be of my opinion, and there they on they kept me a long time. And because I lay still and did not cry, my Lord Chancellor and Master Rich took pains 
to rack me with their own hands until I was nigh dead. This is Lord Chancellor Thomas Risley and his cohort, Richard Rich. If you're an aficionado of Henry's court or a reader of, Henry, of Hilary Mantel's Cromwell novels, these names will be very familiar to you, along with the infamous Bishop of Winchester, Stephen Gardner. These men were in the conservative faction who wished to return the church to the authority of Rome, or at least they seemed to want this. But what they really wanted, I believe, was to rule after Henry's death. He was old at this time. He was ill, incapacitated by his supering leg, failing in health. It was clear he could not live long. His son Edward was only nine. He could not rule alone, but would need a protectorate. Would it be the conservative faction, represented by Gardner, Risley, and Rich, or the reformist faction, represented by Jane Seymour's brothers, Edward and Thomas, and in fact, by Queen Catherine Parr herself. Gardner and his faction were determined it should be they, and it was for this reason they tried to bring down the queen. Their desire to manipulate Henry into turning against her as he had turned against previous wives and counselors. Catherine Parr was, like Anne Askew, of the reformist faith. She was known to hold Bible studies with her ladies, and she had written and published devotional books of prayers and reflections on the Psalms. Like Anne, she was intelligent, intellectual, and outspoken about her beliefs. She was also a beloved stepmother to Henry's children, a kind of nurturer to Henry himself. She tended to his bad leg. She encouraged him to try to read with reading glasses. And she had, unfortunately for her, made an enemy of Stephen Gardner and Thomas Risley. So long as she had the king's trust and support, she was protected from, their, from her enemies. But the moment that was lost, they moved in for the kill. One day, Stephen Gardner overheard Henry grumbling about Catherine and her theological arguments, saying things had come to a pretty pass when husbands are instructed by their wives in theology. Gardner sprang. He convinced Henry that Catherine's views and those of her ladies were heretical and potentially even treasonous. Now, it was common practice in the political and religious machinations of Henry's court to arrest minor offenders in order to get them to name names of those of their sect who were higher placed in the court or the church. Because of the ruthlessness of their questioning when she was in the, on, on the rack in the tower, trying to find out who maintained Anne in prison, who had given her maid money for food, and because they returned again and again to questions about her connections to Catherine's ladies-in-waiting, we know that what they wanted when they tortured her was not so much for her to recant her beliefs, though they would certainly have welcomed that, but they wanted her to identify these women of the court as heretics, traitors, and by implication, Queen Catherine Parr herself. So we know that Henry pushed, that, I'm sorry, that Stephen Gardner pushed Henry to arrest Catherine, and that at some point, Henry agreed. An arrest warrant was prepared, but the warrant was accidentally dropped in a hall, well, neither accidentally or perhaps on purpose, and news of the impending arrest came to Catherine. Immediately, she fell into a loud and despondent hysteria, whether it was acted or true, a true panic attack, we don't know. Certainly with the history of Henry's other wives before her, she was well justified in her panicking. She went to the king and got down on her knees and begged for his mercy. He reminded her of all the times she'd argued theological points with him, sought to instruct him and not be instructed by him. She groveled. I am but a woman, she said with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of my sex. Therefore, in all matters of doubt and difficulty, I must refer myself to your majesty's better judgment as my lord and head. Then she went on to explain that she'd only argue with him to distract his mind from his painful leg and also that she might be better taught by him. That I, hearing your majesty's learned discourse, might receive to myself some profit thereby. And is it even so, sweetheart, replied the king, and tended your arguments to no worse end than 
perfect friends are we again as ever at any time heretofore. Yes, Mercurial Henry. The next day, when Risley arrived with guards to arrest the queen, Henry dismissed the soldiers, and he rebuked him soundly. Knave, errant knave and fool, he called him. And Risley retreated, tail tucked between his legs. Well, in fact, it was because they had succeeded so well in arousing Henry's suspicions against his wife without sufficient supporting evidence that Risley and Richard Rich were so desperate to support their charges, they became willing to torture Anne Askew, a female, a gentlewoman, a confessed heretic already condemned to the fire. And this is how Anne Askew became the only woman in history recorded to have been both racked in the Tower of London and burned at the stake. Her story went out all over England and across the narrow sea to the, to the Low Countries, where many reformists had escaped during the rise of the conservatives. After her writings were published in, in the months after her death, she became even more famous. And the backlash against her treatment was such that no more heretics were burned in London, in London during Henry's reign, and no other women or high-born reformists at all at least not until Henry's daughter Mary came to the reign, the one <clears throat> that um, came to be known as Bloody Mary when some 300 Protestants were burned, but that was years later. So in this sense, Anne Askew was Henry VIII's last martyr, though he was certainly not the last person, she was certainly not the last person he had executed. Anne died on July 16th, 1546. Henry died six months later. January 28th, 1547. So all of this is the history that underpins Prize for the Fire. It's not, however, finally, what the novel is about. The novel is about how did she get here? So I came to find, learn about Anne Askew when I was a very young girl, and I, when I learned that we had the same last name, when I learned that she was a writer, when I learned that she actually went to um, London to seek a divorce from her husband she, in, from her very unhappy marriage, when I learned that she um, was a, a famous gospeler, as she was called, in London in um, the er early days of the Reformation. I became really interested in her story and eventually determined to write about it. But what I needed to find out was how she got there. I, I, I had one question before me the whole time, which was how does someone come to believe something so much that they're willing to die for it, that they are willing, in fact, to be burned alive for it? And um, I'm not sure if I fully answered that question in the novel, but I sought the answer to that question in the novel. So to try to understand Anne's life and to discover what happened to her, I had to go back and look at the climate and the culture, what they were like in her lifetime, the early days of the Reformation. I had to understand its politics and religion. I had to um, see uh, how, I had to learn how religion absolutely affected every moment and every uh, aspect of lives in England at that time. Um, there were many, many people who were cruelly put to death for their faith, sentenced to die because of their beliefs in certain points of doctrine. That's the sort of technicality that Anne was um, sentenced for. But the book itself is uh, much more about Anne's young life and how she came to that end. And um, it's when, when, the, when the book opens, she's 15 years old. This is all historical, which is that when she was 15 years old, her older sister had been um, betrothed to marry a man named Thomas Kine. And uh, you know, in those days, a woman did not have any uh, control over who she married. She had no say-so over who she married, especially a, a woman of the, of the gentry class and above. And her father was the one who determined that she married, and if a woman's father was no longer alive, um, then her brothers determined who she would marry. Well, in this case, Anne's older sister Martha was betrothed to Thomas Kime, and Martha died and was not able to fulfill the contract. And so Anne's father, Sir William Askew, made her for fulfill the contract to stand in for her sister and to marry this man named Thomas Kime who was very different in his religious faith than Anne was. And he was also, we don't know a whole lot about him. One of the things that we do know um, 
much later in, in their lives together is that he violently threw her out of the house. And so I took that historical um, quotation and enlarged it somewhat um, to make uh, the man that she's married to, um, to make that marriage absolutely untenable. But Anne had no choice. And uh, this was the condition for women in this time. So she's, um, she does not have a good life. Her mother-in-law is cruel, her husband abusive, her only comforts are her sister's English Bible, which Anne has secretly brought with her, and also her young maid, Beatrice. Anne talks to her dead sister, she prays to her actually, reads the Bible because she has nothing else to engage her hungry mind, and waits despairingly for a change she cannot realistically expect. So I'm going to read for you a bit, from opening from the book. So all of this sounds like very, very dark and heavy, heavy weighted uh, subject matter. And in fact, it is. But it's not rendered that way. It's rendered, in fact, with, um, with a good deal of humor and uh, with the richness of character, I hope. And so I'm going to read for you in Anne's voice the very opening of the book, where she is um, just recently married. She's 15 years old. She's been married about six months, I think. And she's living in Friskney, which is also in Lincolnshire, but it's far away from her own home in South Kelsey. And she's talking to her sister, Maddie, um, which is what she calls Martha. And this is um, in the winter of 1537. She says, they live meanly here, Maddie, and demand of me that I do the same. It is not poverty of purse, but meanness of spirit, which causes them to crimp their mouths if one but ask for a bit of beef for one's supper. Oh, my dear sister, you cannot imagine. I say this daily, hourly, and then I think, but she does know. She must know everything, see everything from her place on high. Do you, Maddie? Can you see all? Know all? Or are you in that other place where the priests say we must suffer until we are burned pure enough to enter heaven, our souls scoured by fire to be made fit for God's presence? I cannot bear to think of you in purgatory, suffering penance for sins which I know to be no more vile than a butterfly may sin when she lights upon the primrose to steal its nectar. You are good and pure and pious beyond measure. Why would God not take you directly to his bosom the very instant the breath left your body? I tell myself it must be so. Yet my heart will not settle. My thoughts turn to no good purpose. The urgings in my limbs cause me to walk and walk. Though there is no comforting place where I may walk in the whole of this fetid country, and no person to turn to, no friend or brother to ask, and I dare not read thy secret book, which I carried with me from South Kelsey, for he would discover me and tell the vicar, and the vicar would accuse me. He would say, it is this reading of scripture which causes my heart to doubt. Not so. At least, I think it is not so. He conspires with the kimes daily, you know, this dour and wolfish priest, Thomas Jordan. I would a thousand times prefer our old piggy Father Sebastian to this cold-eyed vicar who comes skulking about in the evenings to advise and direct him, my so-called husband, and his bald-pated father, and most especially his mother, the old mistress, Margaret Kime, who is round and puffed as a mother hen, though she watches the comings in and goings out of goods in this household with the ravening eyes of a hawk. It was she who discovered the missing sweetmeats I had taken from the larder, for the which I am banished to this airless tomb until my so-called husband returns from Lincoln. Banished, like a child, to sit and ponder my iniquities, as the old mistress tells me, and I am not even allowed to have my maid to attend me. And where does she think she is given that right? I shall send a letter to father to tell him how she treats me. I told her this. She seemed in no manner concerned. And yet, if it were not for how I must sit here for hours on end in daylight, or what passes for daylight in this cursed Fen country, I should be glad for the nights of peace when I am able to sleep in my cold marriage bed, alone, though I do not sleep. I am up at all hours. 
wandering this cramped room wall to wall to wall. What would I give to be in that large sweet room of our childhood? Our own oaken bed with its velvet curtains and pale pillow beers, the color of clotted cream, sewn by your own hands in those months before you. Oh, Maddie, if you had not died, I would not now be here. I know, I must consider. If you had not died, you would be the one here suffering beneath that man's stubby thumb and the greedy eyes of his mother, small penance in this lifetime that I have taken your place. And then my selfish soul will whisper, but perhaps Maddie should not have minded so very much. Oh, see, see, I am still, even this day, the same selfish girl I have ever been. I remember your hurt eyes that last morning we spoke. I see again your sweet smile, feel again how your smile caused such rage in me. And then my foul words that morning fly back to my ears and I, oh, I cannot bear it. I must walk. If you had not died, I murmur the words beneath my breath like a novena, whisper them at morning prayer. I cry them in silence to the black night through the small slit of window or as now to the glowering noontide fog enclosed in enclosing the small flat yard from which I can see nothing, only gray mists and ghosts of sheep grazing at their mangers, for there is no green in this mud brown land, not in winter, perhaps there will be in summer, but by Whitsuntide or sooner, I feel that I shall follow thee in death. She is ever after me, the old mistress, bidding me drudge through the thousand te tedious tasks she lays out for me. I stand at the work in my linen cap and think to myself, this is thy life now, Anne Kime, and evermore shall be to spend thy days minding milkmaids and overseeing the carding of the wool and the polishing of pewter and sewing and sewing and sewing. And when it is not she, it is he, my so-called husband, who is after me in the night. He will have me regardless of whether I am well or unwell, and most especially when he is angry. And it is for this reason I do try very hard not to make him angry, because he must ever follow his berating of me with his rough mounting, and it is ugly and painful, and I abhor it truly. But seeing as how thus thou hast escaped it by reason of thy death, I think it is nothing that thou should have to endure thinking about now. I do wonder at times, though, if he would not now be so quick to anger if I'd had the wit to hold my laughter on our wedding night <laughs> and not let it snort and snigger into the room. <laughs> Even now when I think of it, I want to laugh, <laughs> so I must not think of it. <laughs> no, I will think of it. <laughs> and what's more, I shall tell you, <laughs> and laugh as long as I like or I have no one else to tell it to. Oh, I should have prepared better. I knew what was to take place in the marriage bed. A, a wife must kiss her husband and surrender to all sorts of naughties. Did I not tease you with those very words? Yet I could not really have prepared myself for that which caused me such trouble. His knees, no, truly. How many wives, I do wonder, may say their fate was laid out for them by their husband's knobby knees. <laughs> not many, I'll warrant. This may not be all the truth, but it is surely part. And it began on the very night of our wedding, when I came alone to this room, and young Beatrice came to undress me. Do you remember her? The little red-haired servant girl from the kitchen? She is jumpy as a hare and not well-trained. But she is my one gift from father besides your dowry chest, which I have brought with me from South Kelsian, and I'm grateful for her, despite her clumsy hands and timid face. Oh, you're trembling, miss, she said to me as she unlaced me. Am I? It is cold in here. I knew then my fear had overtaken me, which I had managed to push away even until the end of the wedding mass, when we two stood liars at the door of the church. Yes, liars for he had vowed before God he would love, honor, and comfort me, and I have had none of that from him. And I promised from that day forth to honor, obey, and serve him, and I tell you my soul roars at the very notion. But Maddie, 
I tried. I swore that I would make him a good and humble wife, but even Beatrice saw how I trembled. I shall be warm enough in bed, I told her. Quick now, bring me my new smock. She put the smock over my head. It is the fine cambric one you sewed for your wedding night, Maddie. I brought it with me, as I brought all your linens and sheets and embroidered napkins and your beautiful book, which I keep as I found it in the bottom of your dowry chest. Beatrice combed out my hair, the two of us quivering like combies, conies in the center of the room. Then came a sharp rap at the door, and we both jumped. Beatrice, taking her stub of candle and giving me a long, worried look, went out, and in the next moment, he came in, wearing a scowl, which he intended, no doubt, should create fear and obedience in his new wife. It failed him poorly. He removed his black gown and laid it on the clothes press, stood before me in doublet and stockings, and I lowered my gaze. Turn, he ordered me. At first, I did not know what he wanted me to do, but glancing up, I saw his arm outstretched and his finger pointing to the wall, and I understood then that he meant me to face away so that he might change his dress. I turned towards the corner. I heard the sounds of unclasped doublet, unbuckled codpiece, all the tug and pull of linen strange to my ears, until at last I heard him say, you may come to bed, wife. He stood next to the bed in his sleeping cap and nightshirt, his face glowing pink. Beneath the hem of his shirt, his legs were pale and thin as hazel twigs. The sight of Kime's hairless sticks, his two knees like white knobs in the lamp shadows, it made me burst out. If thy legs had been any poorer, sir, you'd have need of a barrow to cart yourself about. <laughs> and then I could not help it. I began to laugh. <laughs> oh, you should have seen his fury. Or no, indeed, you should not. His face swelled up red and bloated till I thought his very head would burst, which made me laugh the more, which angered him further. And he stood sputtering at me to be silent, and I, near choking, kept saying, I will, yes, yes, but I could not. His fury grew larger. Stop, he yelled. Thou insolent, feckless woman, shut thy mouth. By the time I got hold of myself and quieted my laughter, all hope for his tender care of me, if ever there had been any, was surely lost. And then, oh, never mind. You needn't hear of my pain and embarrassment that night. But I will tell you this. I lied when I said his lips are like a jackdaw's beak. In truth, they're more like a mallard's bill, stiff and hard that way, but somewhat malleable and protruding. His mating, too, is rather like a duck's excepting, alas, not over with so quick, though mercifully not near so frequent. When at last, snoring loudly, he slept, I lay in the dark, staring up at the tester and burning with shame for what a wife must endure from her husband, until in my mind I would see again his knobby knees and his red sputtering face. I would try to hold myself very still upon the bed so that I might not shake the man awake with my quaking laughter. So thank you all. So I don't know if we're going to have a, a little time if people would have any questions that they would like to ask um, relative to the era or the book or Anne's story. OK, so I haven't quite finished yet. But was Ask You always spelled that way, or was her dad's last name spelled a little different? Yes, her, father's, her father and her brother spelled it in the original old English way, which it was a-Y-S-C-O-U-G-H. So it looks like Ascoff. Um, and and I, there's no way for us to know exactly how it was pronounced. And we don't know exactly when she, but she changed it to Askew. In all of her writings, she signed her name, Anne Askew, spelled A-S-K-E-W. And uh, there are a few places where she spells, because you know they had spelling was all over the place in early England. Um, but there are a few places where she spells it A-S-K-E-W-E. But nowhere does she spell it A-Y-S-C-O-U-G-H. But that's how her father and brothers always spelled it. And I think it was pronounced close to the same. But one of the things that's really interesting is that, is that she took back her maiden name. And of course, that becomes a thread all the way through the novel, where she says, Kime, my name is not Kime. She, she leaves him. Well, actually, he throws her out. I don't want to tell too much of I know there are people who haven't read the book yet, 
but um, he, he does um, expel her from the home. Uh, and she goes to stay with one of her brothers. And um, it's, at, it's at that time that she begins to um, say that she's, she's not gonna go back to him and that um, her, um, and she seeks a divorce first of all in the church courts in Lincoln, in the bishop's court, and then eventually she goes to find it in, to, to, goes to London to try to uh, get a divorce in the court of chancery, but she has no luck in either place. But again and again she says, my name is not Kime. My name is Askew. Okay. Don't you have a seat? Mm -hmm. First question I'd like to ask is, um, there was such changes, not only in the religious sphere and the political sphere, but uh, technologically, mm -hmm art, music, in that period. How does that, what are the lessons from that period that we can use for today? Uh, boy, that is such a good question. And there are so many parallels, I would say, and not least the invention of the printing press, so that in this explosion of information and um, people, uh, so much of Anne's story is grounded in the, translation of the Bible into English. And it, it, was, it became against the law um, for a woman to read the Bible. That's a, a, a real narrative thread all the way through here. But the, the holding, uh, um, holding of information in the hands of a few was just exploded with the, with the printing press in the same way that this has happened with us, with the internet and um, social media and all the other ways that we understand that our entire society and culture is changing because none of the old rules apply. And so I think that there, and, and then also the, the forces of religion. So I think we live in a much more secular age in general, but with their parts of the country. So as you know, I'm from Oklahoma and then we're here in Texas, um, there, and many other parts of the country where religion is still a very uh, potent, uh, force not only in people's lives, but a potent political force. And this was the case during Anne Askew's lifetime. There was no separation of church and state. There, you know, the king was the church, and the church was the king, and that was, that was what Henry did, and that's, that's why Henry really was the ar ar architect of the English Reformation, not the overall Reformation. But to say what lessons we can learn, I don't know, don't burn people because of religion. <laughs> That would be a good one, good start. Uh, not, you know, my question for myself was how does someone come to a faith where they are willing to die for it? But I, I don't investigate in the novel, but I do wonder about this, about how m one can believe something so much they're willing to kill for it. And we have entirely too much of that uh, is what's happening and whether it's, it, not necessarily from 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 political forces, but from forces that have been unleashed that allow um, hatred and fear and um, belief that how I believe is the only possible um, valid point of view. And no one else, not only are, are their points of view not valid, their lives are not valid. And is the epitome of the serenity prayer. <laughs> she exhibited courage to change the things she thought she could change, mm -hmm. and she accepted with serenity the things she couldn't change. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Well, I think that's true towards the end of her life. I will say she, um, um, as it says in the Bible, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? I've forgotten exactly what the what the circumstance with that, but she she was always kicking against the pricks. She was always resisting the forces that tried to subdue her, that would not let her have her, her intellectual engagement, that would not allow her to read, that would not uh, allow her to um, live the life in, and the faith that she came to. But in the novel, we don't know really how she came or when she came to faith, that that's not in the historical record, but that's why we have historical fiction so that we can imagine those lives. And within the novel, we watch her go from a young girl, like this young girl I've just read, who's, um, you know, 
rebellious and sassy and um, try and, and tries to be good, tries to subscribe to the role that the, her society has given her, but she just can't. So in those, in those um, really for much of the novel, she does not accept what she can't change. She doesn't even know she can't change it. She just keeps trying. She just keeps seeing. And, and for her, uh, and we know this because of the examinations of Anne Askew that at the end, when she was put on trial again and again, she answered them over and over again with scripture, with, with quotations from the Bible that was, she had memorized copious amounts of, of, of the Christian Bible translated into English. And that's what all of her authority lay on rather than her own um, will or ideas. But, but we don't know how she got there historically, but in the novel we can see how her powerlessness in her life, where she has no recourse, not from her husband, not from her brothers, not from her culture, not from her religion, not from her in-laws, not from anything. Um, and so she resists and resists, and then ultimately it becomes that the only way she really can resist, the only thing that she has that she can do is believe the way she wants to believe, is think the way she wants to think is read what she wants to read, and um, so it. She pours her intellectual hunger, her desire to investigate conditions of the world, into um, reading and memorizing scripture in English, and um, and that becomes the the source of her faith. And so then she really does think that everything that she thinks and believes and says is true because she can quote you the scripture that will support it. <laughs> well, I always find it amazing about that period that uh, if you were caught smuggling Bibles in English from mm -hmm. a lot of them came in from the Netherlands and mm -hmm. so forth, uh, you were executed. You could be executed. And for tortured it. before mm -hmm. executed. And then also um, people would hide the English versions in the fireplace. And if your family member was tortured, they might say, well, my brother does have a copy in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. And they would, without a search warrant, go over to the house and take the mm -hmm. Bible out and then arrest you. And mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's it, so, and that, and that was at one period uh, very early on. And then Henry VIII um, had the great Bible translated into English and placed in every church in England that, that enchained there um, in the church uh, all across the country. And so he was so mercurial and he just went back and forth, back and forth. So he, under the influence of Thomas Cromwell and others of the reformist faith, did have the Bible translated into English and placed in all the churches across England. And then there was um, so much dissension about doctrine and all those things. And so they he swung back the other way and they passed another law that said, no one below the class level of gentlemen um, and uh, above, no, nobility, uh, and no women, no apprentices, no merchants could read the Bible. And then they finally amended it and said that a woman could read the Bible to herself alone, but never in public or never with, with others. And um, it, it, it went back and forth so many times. And then, um, so we have to, you know, you have to sort of know what the progression was. So yes, that that uh, suppression and outlawing, beginning really uh, largely with Tyndale's New Testament, which happened just a slightly before this this novel begins, and all the way to the, the the Bible being chained in all the churches and then being taken out of the churches, and then um, Henry's son was very Protestant in his faith, so that was real. That was great. We read the Bible everywhere. Um, that was Edward, but then he died when he was, I believe, sixteen, and then Mary, who was very Catholic, came to the throne, and so then the Bible was in English was completely suppressed again, and that was where so many um, named heretics um, were reformist were burned um, as, as heretics, um, including many, many men of the church. Um, and so that went on for a few years, and then Elizabeth came to the throne, and then who was being hidden in the cupboards? Priests, <laughs> Catholics, you know, so it, the pendulum swung exactly the other way. So you might have, you know, one family might have been hiding the Bible, and then the other family might have been hiding the priest. So um, it's... And that's all our heritage, you know? We are still living out the legacy of the Reformation in general, but as very specifically of the English Reformation and the things that happened um, after these years that have, that have been 
writing about all the way leading up to the English Civil War and then the pilgrims who and the Puritans who came here. And we are living out the legacy of that establishment here on this continent. And I mean, there are many other elements that we're living out the legacy of well of as well. But some of the some of our political turmoil even now is grounded in in all of this history. We so often we don't understand how things that happened 500 years ago could still be so affecting us. But if we don't know where we've been, we don't know why we're here. One of the uh, influences of the Renaissance was the discovery by Moses Ben Monides of the classical philosophers like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle in Egypt because he spoke Hebrew, Latin, uh, Greek, mm -hmm. and no, no telling how many languages. He could recognize these um, philosophers as being the works of these famous he knew about them, but the works were all destroyed in Greece through all the wars and battles mm -hmm. and fires. And so we, all we have of Aristotle and Socrates and so forth are from translations into Arabic and, and that he discovered. He translated out of Arabic back into Hebrew and Latin, and then it seems like they had a major influence on the Renaissance. Can you t tell us how the past discovery of past wisdom influenced the period in which Anne lived? Uh, that's a good question. You're, you're, uh, to a degree, you're talking about uh, uh, areas that I haven't s studied as much. Although during the great humanist Erasmus was very, very famous at, at, at this time, and he uh, you know, disseminated the kind of wisdom that you're speaking of. And he, you know, th there was only in that in that Western world, there was only the church. You know, there wasn't. It's it's hard for I think contemporary readers and listeners to understand how powerful influence was. It was the order of the world. There weren't people who said, "Well, maybe I believe. I don't believe." You know, uh, so there were differences of doctrine, differences of, of many kinds, but but not much not much uh, disbelief. Let me say. So even Erasmus, um, he um, he he did. Um, interpretations of the gospel and so forth. But he was very much a humanist and he had a strong influence, I think, on Cromwell and on, on, on Henry VIII in the, in the early time. And um, so I, all of this was, you're right, it was the rediscovery of knowledge that had already been, that had already belonged to us. And, and then when that knowledge is repressed and we can see this, in, in this time, here we are in a library in a time when uh, people are trying to suppress what people can know and um, what, 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 what people can learn, what people can read, what people can understand. And when, when that happens, then you know, so, so much knowledge can be lost. Uh, knowledge that helps us understand really the, what it means to be human and how to navigate this chaotic world that we're living in with all of these changes this, you know, this explosion of technology, climate change, um, you know, uh, complications, and people not trusting or believing in um, institutions that have been, that have guided things for, you know, hundreds of years. And I think that that also began to happen with the Reformation when if the church was just the church and if people start doubting the church and begin to say, well, that's, you know, they're not, they're not doing that that right. They're not doing that right. And um, by the way, the Bible says this, no matter what the church says, that there's no purgatory in, in, in this translation of the Bible, then there's a great uncertainty and people latch on to whatever certainty they can find to believe in. I think that's really what Anne Askew did. So that they, they she, she read the Bible, she took it quite literally, and she studied it, and she it was an intellectual investigation, and she and but she took it absolutely to be the word of God, so that when she came to see something in it and believe in it, then that then she was absolutely confident in what it was that she, how she took it, what she thought it meant, 
including, you know, that it's but a symbol of the body and blood of Christ, when she knew to continue to declare that meant that she would be burned alive. It's, it's unfathomable, and yet people do many um, surprising things because of what they believe. They will, they will die, not, maybe not even intending to, but just die because, they have, because of what they believe. That's a wonderful answer. Uh, my last question. In terms of character development, mm -hmm. what were some of your challenges? I think my biggest challenge is that if you read the examinations of Anne Askew, there's no way to read it and not come away thinking this is a religious fanatic. You know, that she's that because she is so certain of what she says and and how she says it. And she was an early prototype of a feminist, as you as you might imagine. Um, and she sometimes played on her. Um, she would say, oh, but I'm just I'm a, but a poor woman. I know nothing about the order of schools. They told her, you know, that she wasn't she would she, that she was not supposed to ask the questions. You know, only they were supposed to ask the questions because that's how it was done in school. And she was going, oh. I'm just a woman. I don't know how they do things in school. Um, but, she, um, but she really, I wanted to deeply humanize her and make her not, n neither a, a, an unrealistic heroine in terms of, you know, putting contemporary understanding of what, uh, how a, a bold woman might be. She was still circumscribed by her era and her, and her, and the life that was given to her. I also wanted to give her a kind of, hum give her some flaws. She's definitely got some flaws and um, make her um, believable in a three-dimensional way so that she's not merely you know, too good to be true, a, a saint, she's no saint. Um, she doesn't hear voices, she doesn't see visions, she, um, but she comes through an intellectual investigation of the written word. She studies a text, and of course, with my background in literature and uh, as a writer, I, you know, I, 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 I love that. So those, those are some of the things that I was able to give her, so that she doesn't come off one-dimensional as just a religious fanatic who, um, who, who has who has no complexity, just one-dimensional. Excellent. Now tell the audience how they can buy the book. Well, it's available at any online bookseller. It's available at your favorite local independent bookstore if you've got one, if you're fortunate enough to have one nearby. Um, and uh, yes, it's you know Barnes and Noble and any. There's a there's a wonderful uh, online bookseller called Bookshop dot Bookshop dot org, I believe it is, um, and they. Um, give us a, 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 a contribution to local independent bookstores when you uh, purchase from them. So if you want to order online and you have a, you know, you, and you want to support independent booksellers, um, then go to bookshop.org. Thank you. Rila asked you for this, for this wonderful story about Anne Askew. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Tom. And thank you all.